a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very The expanding reality. The expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this incredibly cool episode, we have author and researcher Mary Joyce joining us to talk about her book, Spy in the Sky, Secrets and Cover-Ups on Earth and Beyond. And this is satellite photos that show things that shouldn't be there, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, on the Earth part of it would be Antarctica and underwater really cool underwater stuff that we talk about on this and the beyond of course would be the crazy cool stuff on our moon all the way out to mars and even our sun it's a super cool conversation you guys are absolutely going to love mary and all the ways to find her her book and her amazing website are going to be located down in the show notes make sure that you'll check her out while you guys are down there check out also expandingrealitypodcast.com that's where links to all the socials can be found that's the central hub for everything all the videos play over there everything's all set up for you guys so go check it out also uh, that's where you can sign up to become an expansive insider now that is where all the bonus stuff is and that's one of the best ways to support the show now we are a value for value system here so if you find the show valuable all we ask is that you you know like and share like everybody else but also return the value in exchange. That's just the way that things work and it's working out pretty well. So you guys hop on board. It's been an incredible ride and I'm grateful for everybody that's participating in value exchange with us. All right, guys, so let's get to this incredibly cool conversation with Mary Joyce. Ladies and gentlemen, welcoming to the show, we have Mary Joyce hanging out with us. You are an absolute delight. You are already have a special place in my heart. You and I have been speaking quite a bit here, and I just really enjoy you. So I'm very excited for my audience to get to know you as well. Now, uh, you sent me your incredibly cool book, Spy in the Sky. And this, of course, guys, is going to be linked down in the show notes as well as all the other ways to find you, Mary, your website, your YouTube, all the really cool stuff. You do some phenomenal work. And so, like I said, again, I can't wait for my audience to meet you. And up top here, I'd like to thank Mark Eddy, uh, who reached out to me on Facebook. He's uh, facilitated this and he introduced the two of us. So thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Shout out, man. Y'all go follow him on Facebook there. I'll link him below. So uh, Mary, for my audience, it's not too familiar with you here. Do you mind just letting us know a little bit about you, darling? Well, I'm going to start with something different, because the first time we talked, you saw the cartoons I have back on the wall, and they are done by professional cartoonists. And I worked with them in the cartoon department at the Orlando Sentinel many, many years ago. And this conversation that you and I had revealed that you are into cartoons also. So uh, that's how our first conversation started. It had nothing to do with anything else. Right. We launched and you even look like one of the guys that uh, was one of the cartoonists. And he, uh, his name was Fred Wagner, and he took over the old uh, classic, um, I don't know, like editorial kind of cartoon, the Grin and Barrett, which has been around probably yeah. since our grandparents. Yes. And uh, he had to learn the guy's style when he died, and uh, he took it over. But you look a lot like him. His hair is a little bit shorter than yours, but uh, uh, you look very similar. All right, Frank, you handsome devil. You're welcome on the show anytime you want, buddy. And it was so sweet when you sent me the, your, your book. Not only did you uh, send it, uh, first of all, so thank you again. Uh, number two, you signed it, and it was very sweet. And so you wrote, nice surprise, that you're in the funny business, in quotes here. And uh, just very, very sweet because, yes, you and I have an affinity for that. We didn't even touch your book, so all this is going to be fresh for us as far as conversation goes, which is great. But, yeah, you and I just hit it off on comics. And, you know, I told you my story about Calvin and Hobbes, and I'm just in love with them. And uh, that kind of kicked off my love of reading and all of that kind of stuff. So yes, you and I uh, have a lot in common, young lady, and you're a Southern girl too. So that's awesome. No, I'm not. My mother was Southern. Most of my life was in the North. <laughs> so well, I'm more Yankee than Southern. You're Southern now. So what we say is that you weren't born here, but you got here as fast as you could, you know? Okay, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Yes, ma'am. All right. So Spy in the Sky, tell me about it. What, uh, what brought this about? It's incredible. Um, we briefly mentioned the website that I have, which is... Um, 
uh, skyshipsovercashers.com. And we started out just covering things about UFOs. But there is so much that's going on here in the mountains of Western North Carolina uh, that this uh, website just has expanded and expanded. And we've covered Bigfoot and Cherokee Little People and giants uh, because we've even found uh, skeletons of giants here in this in these mountains. Um, did I say underground bases? We just have done a lot of different things. And what happens was or what happened was that i began to collect all this information from just my own research for the website and i wasn't finding this anywhere else and i've had so much of it and it, it's really become a mission i want people to know uh the information that's being kept from us and i discovered things on mars on the moon around the sun at the bottom of the ocean in antarctica and they're all things that um um hardly anybody knows about and uh the book is an adult picture book there's only three pages that don't well that's fine it looks boring but that has an explanation with it those are um the first ones that looked all orange those are all mars pictures yeah and uh those are undersea pictures and oh. there's some more um but i give the coordinates and i let people find these things for themselves because we have so many people that are uh into um photoshopping bogus information and bogus images and so i give people the coordinates they can use google earth and they can find these things for themselves now sometimes uh, both on mars and in antarctica there have been very deliberate efforts to uh, wipe these things out so people can't see them and there's a key on the keyboard, which everybody ought to know about if they don't already. It's and, and you can print the whole page or the whole screen. And there have been times I've posted things on the website and the next day they have been blurred out, blotted out, erased. And so if I hadn't hit the print the screen button, I wouldn't have the before and after evidence. Damn. And uh, one of the most dramatic ones was uh, in Antarctica. And I found two entrances into Mars. The largest one was uh, about, I'm going to give you round numbers, about 300 feet across and 100 feet high. And the very next day when that was on the website, it's like somebody picked up a bottle of ink and poured it all over it. And uh it was like uh, several steps in totally obliterating this. That was the first step. The second step, I zoomed back and I could see where both entrances were. They were both covered up. One had printed on the Google image, hollow earth entrance one, hollow earth entrance two. And then the next part of the cover up, the whole area turned to like a sheet of ice and you would never ever guess it was there. Dang. So that's the kind of cover up and that's the kind of evidence that I include when I have experienced the cover ups. Yeah. And it, it's like they're subscribed to your website just so that they know what they missed to go blur out. It's like they look at you and they go, okay, we need to go find that thing and blur it out because she told us where it was. And you do, you have some phenomenal pictures in here. This is just such a cool book. I'm so grateful. Uh, so uh, the spacecrafts, you know, that skid across. And of course, you know, there's things like the Baltic Sea anomaly, but this one's on Mars and you have all sorts of cool stuff going on. The second crash site on Mars that you have over here on the other side with these skid marks and these pictures are so incredible. And I love how you and have the far out and then a, a more zoomed in version. So we get perspective. Right. And the, the one that has the yellow color to it, yeah. um, you that skid mark, you can measure things on Google Earth. And there is a yellow streak to the on the north side of it in the skinnier picture up on the top one. That's 400 and let's see, 4,400 feet in length. So that skid mark is at least that long. And then it plows into the soil of Earth, I mean of Mars. And uh, that craft itself is over 400 feet in diameter. Yeah. So we're talking some, I mean, 400, uh, four miles in diameter, excuse me, four miles in diameter. So it's huge. It's crazy. Yeah. The length of the object itself is approximately 416 feet and uh, it's got 4,422 feet in length and drag here. Fascinating. It's so well detailed and it's just so cool. It's not overwhelming in the sense of like, oh, there's a lot of data and math and stuff like that. It's so appropriate because you, you give the information and then you sit back. And you let us wonder about it. You know, uh, this this reminds me a lot of Richard C. Hoagland's work. Were you a fan of him? 
Um, he was uh, early on doing the thing with the face on Mars. Yeah. And of course, we've gone way beyond that because the satellite imagery has improved so much. And uh, um, I have found uh, things that go way beyond the face on Mars. That is something from the past. There is evidence of things going on right now. Like I found two habitats, uh, which I use that term to refer to uh, self-contained um uh, living structures. So if you're in an alien environment, um, yeah, it's a little bit blurry on here, but yeah. at least you get the idea. And in the Northern Hemisphere, I found one and it measured 700 feet in length. Jeez. Several years later, I went and started uh, exploring the Southern Hemisphere. I found one that was exactly 10 times bigger. It was 7,000 feet in length. So these are two things that look very, these are not ancient. These are contemporary structures that uh, we're finding. And then uh, you flashed a picture, which looks kind of boring at first, but it's uh, the entrances into Mars Oh yeah, and, yeah. that you showed at the very beginning. Yeah. And the entrances into Mars are, they range in size from 400 feet in width to about a thousand feet in width. And the reason I have the detailed pictures of them is because they look the same at first, but then when you look and measure them, and then you look at the details around them, uh, they're not exactly the same. But here is the part I got really excited about. Normally, when I look at a planet and explore it with Google Earth, I go from left to right or left uh, right to left. One day, as you say, popped out of my brain and started going thinking differently, started going from north to south. And I found 27 warehouse shaped entrances into mars all in a line spread out over 16 miles and um uh, i just found that phenomenal yeah and it's like a rash is what you call one of these things on here where it's all scattered out and i know this is blurry guys but definitely check the show notes for the uh yeah it looks link. like a rash but when you uh, zero in on it yeah uh, you can see that they look metal and they uh, have a uh, tubular shape to them um the pictures in the book, I assure everybody, are sharp. These are not sharp when we see them this way, but at least you have an idea of yeah. what they look like. Yeah, the focus. That's is another one that was covered up because after I posted that, those become kind of blurry looking and they don't look like they did originally. And again, if anybody starts exploring this stuff, remember that uh, print screen button. Hit it because when you find really good things, sometimes people don't want you to know it or yeah, save it. They want to cover it up. When it's even cooler that you get those and then you have the timestamp from when that was collected, you know, the data is tracked on your machine and then you release something and then it's covered up and you can track that. You can say, hey, I released this. And then two days later, it was like this. It was blurred out. And now right. you have this where you have the actual evidence and it overlays perfectly. That is so interesting. So uh, what uh, what else did you find on Mars? Um, I found a, uh, the two crash sites, which you kind of flashed at us, but I also found a uh, UFO that's parked on Mars. And it is, let's see if I can remember my dimensions again. I think that one's uh, three and a half miles in diameter. And you can see the shadow. It casts a shadow. And in the middle, it has a raised portion to it uh, and looks very much like some of the UFOs that we are able to see from Earth. Uh, but again, um, a UFO that's uh, three and a half miles in diameter is pretty good size. It's a pretty good size. Yeah. Uh, you, you just, like I said, have some phenomenal work in here. This is just awesome. I love this. I love things like that. Okay. So uh, now I'm curious about uh, Antarctica because you also have some really interesting pictures in here about that. So there's uh, several things that I get really excited about. Um, one is just the fact that so much is uh, on Mars and happening now and it's contemporary. And be before we get back to Earth, let's st stick with Mars just for a little bit. Sure. Um, I want to mention a man with great credentials. His name was Hyman Ashid. He was in charge of Israeli space security for almost 30 years. And in uh, December of 2020, he decided to go public um, about what was going on on Mars. And the whole statement is in my book, but I want to read just a little bit to you. Please. Um, First part, yeah, that's the man. And one of the statements in there is they have been they have been waiting for humanity to we not that's the aliens. They have been waiting for humanity to evolve and reach a stage where we will generally understand what space and spaceships are. There's an agreement between the U.S. government and the aliens. 
They signed a contract with us to do experiments here. They too are researching and trying to understand the whole fabric of the universe, and they want us as helpers. One more sentence. There's an underground base in the depths of Mars where their representatives are and also our American astronauts. So I have his statement on one page, and the very next page is where I start going into the um, warehouse um, uh, entrances into Mars. Yeah. And, you know, you, you've got this statement written out perfectly, and yes, and then it corresponds amazingly with your evidence that you've found with all of these very, I mean, right angle open boxes. I mean, again, guys, check the show link uh, notes, and then as well, the video versions up here, and we're showing these if you'd like. So the the way that but they're But just squared, imagine 27 of those in a row. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't get them all in one photo, so... I've, I've just given portions of them. Yeah, and you had a great photo here earlier on, and it's right across from what you said here, and there are four very scattered out, and they're very, very small. And so you can kind of yes, get... Yes, you have to back way up to yeah, see them all. And you can kind of get the scale of what you're talking about here. Absolutely fascinating. So with that, we can go uh, back to um, uh, Antarctica. Yeah. And yeah. I already mentioned the cover up of one of the entrances into Mars. And I I guess that that's a very active entrance. That's why they don't want any attention drawn to it. Um, that's my theory. It's It seems to have logic behind it. But almost, a, let's see, in September uh, a year ago, we discovered, and I, there's another person who's helped me with that. We discovered the first of five uh, ancient cities that are emerging from the melting ice in Antarctica. The ice in Antarctica is melting really, really fast. And we're we're finding the, the box uh, shapes, the rectangular shapes of a city. And not only do you have the box shapes, but they flow in like they like cities do today along rivers or along uh, hill uh, shapes. And um, the significance of this, is that most scientists agree that that continent's been covered in ice for 34 million years. That makes these structures the oldest in the world. To give you a comparison, the um, Great Pyramid that everybody thinks is so old isn't even 5,000 years old. So compare that to 34 million. The discovery of those, I think, is phenomenal. And again, there have been efforts when we have posted those to um, uh, blur them out. And I show before and after pictures on that, too. Yeah. And, you know, maybe this happens uh, quite regularly with like the, the odd cycles here. We're kind of seeing our magnetic North Pole move quite a bit, very dramatically. They, they have to update it way more often now, uh, as well as uh, there's evidence of things such as like the Piri Reese map from the 1500s. He was an incredible map maker. And he even said, though, that his map came from earlier. So he copied it. His from was copying another older, one that was older than his. Yes. Yeah. And it showed Antarctica free of ice, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Now you're thinking of a civilization that if it's that if the scientists are right about the ice and if that map was older than the 1500s. Now you're talking about a map that's 34 million years old. That's still, you know, papyrus or could be a copy skin. of a copy, but still, you yeah. know, still it's some kind of evidence. It's very interesting. Now, a quick question for you on this. I was thinking about the modern uh, things that you're finding up there, all the new stuff. Are we back to Mars now? Well, yeah, we're in just in general, actually. So okay. why do you think that they let that go? I understand old stuff. Uh, and especially when NASA was just starting out and they had everything that they were finding on the moon, on Mars, everything like that. Hoagland's work, again, is what just comes to mind. Um, and so they have all this new stuff going up, but they have to know the coordinates of that. And so they have to know, hey, let's blur that out before it makes it to, you know, um, the public air so that Mary can't find it because she's totally going to find it. It's well, just they can't blur out the whole, they can't blur out the whole place. And um, so unless somebody br brings a, you know, brings it to the world's attention or to somebody's attention, um, they're not catching it. I'm sure they're covering up some stuff early on, but uh, um, this has just happened too many times. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I just think it's awesome. I think also it's meant to be found. I think you're supposed to find this stuff. I think well, it's this, kind of this like I said, this is a mission. Yeah. Um, if anybody knows anything about books, especially if you print them in full color, glossy paper, they're expensive. This is not a money making effort on my part. This is where I'm making a contribution to try to get this out because I think people have a right to know this. Love it. Yeah. 
you an altruistic mission and we're on board with you. So again, guys, linked in the show notes and definitely check the uh, website out and your YouTube as well. All of it will be linked. So guys, check it out. It's incredible. So, um, you so, want to dive under the ocean now? You know, yes, I, I kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time on Antarctica just because I'm curious about what you think is going on there now. Um, there's a lot of heads of state and things that go there at really weird times, like crazy, interesting, famous people go down there. It's very restricted. I know one person that said that he stepped foot on there, Brad Olson, who we've had on the show, a phenomenal researcher and author. And you, you can usually only go to this one little peninsula and then everything else is off limits, right? So what do you think is going on down there? And what do you think is going on like now? When I used to live uh, in Florida, I lived between Patrick Air Force Base and the Kennedy Space Center. I got to meet a number of NASA people and one astronaut. The astronaut that I um, got to meet and talk to kind of has your philosophy and my philosophy, and that is the world has a right to know some of this stuff. Uh, he was um, at Mission Control, and he would monitor the screens uh, from the uh, space shuttle. And one day... There, he saw two astronauts talking to a tall alien, about eight or nine feet tall, in the open bay of the shuttle. And you could see the ET's vehicle parked at the end of this. And it was on the screen long enough for him to get, really get a good view of it. He talked too much, and he eventually um, lost his job. He lost all his benefits. He got blackballed. He couldn't find a job anywhere else. Um uh, because he really felt the world had a right to know some of this. Um, it's not that he thought the public had a right to know everything, but he thought some of this we do have a right to know. He became a very good friend of Werner von Braun, which is going to tie this back to your original question. And the two of them have a, had a whole lot in common. And when von Braun would come to Florida for from Houston, um, the two would get together. And many times there were conventions that were going on or awards dinners or whatever. And the two of them would go out um, by a pool or out by the ocean and get away from everybody so they could talk. And also so Von Braun could smoke because he was an avid smoker. And one of the things that he told Clark was that um, uh, the Nazis uh, had built what they call a Shangri-La for Hitler in Antarctica. So that goes back to World War II. Um, the, that's one thing. Another thing that uh, he revealed to Clark was that, um, uh, the ETs from Aldebaran were the ones that were providing information for the Nazi space program because they had early versions of UFOs at, during World War II. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of that activity was going on in Antarctica, um, there, believe it or this is all going to tie together. Believe it or not, there are there, the biggest chain of volcanoes in the world is in Antarctica. If you look at Antarctica, where we have North and South America to the north, uh, it would be on the western side. And there's like um, oh, 138, I think. Uh, there's um, anyhow. So those. Um, Volcanoes are helping to heat up that planet even faster because two of them are constantly active. And then there's a whole slew of other ones. Um, those volcanoes in the past have created volcanic tubes. And so the ETs and then I guess the Nazis later developed these volcanic tubes and expanded them and used them um, as underground facilities. That's At least that would be the way they started them. Yeah, because most of the excavation had already been done, plus they're vitrified the edges because of the heat. You know, it kind of incinerates things and makes it a lot more stable as far as structurally goes for carrying load. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I'm grateful that you brought up the Von, bon, von Braun connection and the Nazis. Uh, we've I had an expansive insider with a couple of friends of mine, and we were speaking about uh, Operation High Jump and, of course, uh, Antarctica, and that you got to bring up the Nazis in New Schwabenland. And, you know, there was a crash, I want to say it was in Belgium, uh, Belgium or Bulgaria, I can't remember which one, in 1938, uh, Belgium, I'm going to say. Uh, and so allegedly the Nazis recovered this thing. Um, 
They then take it down to Antarctica and form New Schwabenland, and this is kind of what you're talking about and ties into the lava tubes and everything like that. The cover on this for going down there in 1939 was uh, that they were looking for uh, whale oil. So I've got this super cheesy joke. I'm, I'm just going to give it to you here now. So the joke is is that the Nazis were going down to Antarctica to, Antarctica to become a whale-oiled machine, right? So. <laughs> They, you don't have to laugh at that. That's fine, ma'am. Thank you, though. You're very sweet. So uh, it's very interesting, though, again, this tie-in in this new Schwabenland. And, you know, Klaus Schwab is related to that. His grandfather uh, actually did a lot of work down there. So there's a bunch of interesting tie-ins to what's going on today in Antarctica, which is why it's so fascinating to me. And I wanted to get your take on it, you know, because there's just so many interesting things going down on there. I, I can't remember the year right now, but th there was one year, I think it was um, around election time. Um, and... Uh, Secretary of State um, Kerry, Sorry. he was one of the ones that went down there, but the leaders of major countries went down there, uh, which you might expect. Uh, one thing that was kind of strange was that uh, um, the, what do you call it? It's the Pope for the Orthodox Church in Russia. He has a different name, but we'll call him the Pope of Russia. And before he went down there, he met with the Roman Pope for the first time ever, and they spent several hours talking together before the Russian Pope went down to Antarctica. Damn. And I thought that was kind of interesting that they got together first. Yeah. Popovich, I think is what you say, right? Or Popovich? It's a Popovich? Russian for I don't Pope. remember his name. Again, being silly. And it's it's just silly. We're having a good time. Oh, okay. okay. I, I, I have to let you know when I'm being funny, which I absolutely adore. You're wonderful. Uh, so Antarctica is a crazy place. It's very interesting. And I'm grateful that you brought up Kerry as well. I want to say it was right after the 2016 election, right? Uh, that he, sounds about right. A day I, after. I, uh day after he went down there. And it's it really weird. It was really Hillary tied Clinton. with an election and nobody expected him to be anywhere but in the United States at that point. Right. And he was like, nope, going to go to Antarctica. Uh, Buzz Aldrin's mm -hmm. been down there. Just a bunch of weird stuff. The guest list on who gets to go down there and all the secret sea is very interesting. Again, the Antarctic Treaty, which Russia allegedly has pulled out of. So there may be a little bit more disclosure, at least controversy, uh, to point our attention that way. You know, maybe we've got something to look forward to. So, uh, yes, let's go underwater now. What is your favorite story about My underwater? My favorite one. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I, the thing that started this for me was um, had nothing to do with something I found, and I do have it in the book, and it's a uh, a major structure that was found off of uh, Malibu, California. Yep. So I figured if if we yes, and it's huge. Those pillars are hundreds of feet tall, tall and um, it's got a thick roof. Uh, the dimensions are probably right there on the page for you, but yeah. I, uh, we're looking at five hundred feet thick. Right. Uh, That's the pillars huge. beneath are 600 to 630 feet tall. And yes, I have seen this image before. And again, I'm grateful. Right. Now, I get no it. credit for that, but I wanted it in the book because that's it's what inspired be. me to start cruising the entire coastline. So I spent I don't know how much time going uh, from Alaska down to the Baja Peninsula and found a lot of things. And the, my favorite one is um, something that definitely looks like an airport. And uh, in the book, I have a picture of that airport and a picture of the Spokane uh, International Airport. So you can see how similar yes. they are in structure. Now, yes. the significant difference, this, the significant difference is that the one under the ocean, which again, you can see very clearly in the book, um, is 89 miles in length. The longest airport in the world right now is just barely longer than three miles. That's roughly 36 miles difference in length. That's roughly the difference, uh, the distance between New York and Philadelphia. What in the world would have a structure that big? Uh, my own working theory is that uh, there absolutely was a continent that uh, existed in prehistory in uh, the Pacific known as Lemuria or Mu. And I think these uh, ancient structures I found along the Pacific coast um, are uh, remnants of that ancient culture. Uh, uh. This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up for brekkie. 
lunch, or dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight <laughs> to your door. They just drop them at your door, people. You'll save time and eat well. You'll stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while taking all of your holiday to-dos in stride with good meals in the tum-tum. If you're too busy with all this stuff, these meals are easy. Easy to get done. They taste great. All you've got to do is head over to factormeals.com slash expandingreality50 and use code expandingreality50 to get 50% off. That's code expandingreality50 at factormeals.com slash expandingreality50 to get 50% off. So cool. Now, I've done something real recently. Let's see, have I got it posted yet? Yes, it was just posted on our uh, website, skyshipsovercashers.com. And it's about the um, some of the finds in Micronesia. And the natives there have old stories about uh, in ancient times, there were giants that flew in the sky and there was war in the sky. And um, there was a... A governor that operated out of there for the for Germany at one point, and he went to one of the ruins, the ancient ruins. I believe it was Nan Madal, and they found the uh, tombs of uh, giants, and one of them was almost ten feet in height. So, if we're talking giant people riding giant vehicles, they might have a giant runway. And Namadal is one of, <clears throat> excuse me, Namadal is one of the most fascinating places. And I'm again, grateful that you included it in this, in this article and you sent it um, to me and I appreciate that because I was looking over it and yes, it's absolutely fascinating. I saw this about that island in Micronesia and I was blown away by it because nobody knows how it got out there, how it was created. It's so far away and it makes so much more sense, your theory as well, that it, something was there and then water rose up to meet it, right? And everything else was sunken beneath it and that's how it was gotten there, that it wasn't all water before. Before. So um, right. it's ab- absolutely fascinating. And I love the tie in with giants. There are so many interesting things about giants uh, to stick with giants real quick and kind of sideball here just a little bit. Have you heard about the giants in the Grand Canyon? I have. What do you think? I think there were giants all over this country. And I've, I've read a couple of books on it where people have really done some great research. Um, and the sad thing is that uh, so many of these skeletons that have been found have been sent off to the Smithsonian, and uh, then the public never sees them again. Uh, Here at the university that's close to me, it's Western Carolina University, they, according to the two anthropology students I've talked to that have graduated, they said that there were uh, giant, two giant skeletons in their forensic lab. Um, I never saw them myself, but these people were coming across as very credible. They said they each had six toes. And then I was at um, um, Dunkin' Donuts having coffee one day, and I heard an anthropology student talking to somebody else. And so I entered myself into the conversation, and uh, she told me that uh, uh, those skeletons and also the remains of the Cherokee little people had, again, been sent to the Smithsonian, which just tears me up because uh, uh, if history is a gives us any indication we probably won't see them again you won't and i've heard horror stories about the smithsonian throwing items off of boats uh in the middle of the ocean after excavation so that they don't question the official they don't challenge the official narrative so what's going on with that why if we have evidence for it why do you think the giants are being suppressed i don't know i don't know i really don't know why do people want to cling so hard to uh the history that we've been spoon fed up to this point um, we should be able to to, to accept the truth. Agreed. And uh, my goodness, even the people who are very fundamental in their Christian beliefs, the Bible is full of stories about giants. Yeah. So if they can accept giants in the Bible, they shouldn't be bent out of shape if we find out we had some around here too. The issue is, and I, I completely agree with you, that their God and <clears throat> religious text tells them that there were giants and that that just happened. But scientists tell them that there wasn't. Now, this is a very interesting relationship then, because now Christians don't believe scientists when they say anything because they don't recognize things that are here because they obviously don't recognize their religion. And so therefore, they're against us, right? Number one, they're sinners and they're going to hell anyway. 
Now, another interesting thing is, is that there's evidence for it, but it's so hidden, like we just discussed with the Smithsonian, Smithsonian that it, mainstream science doesn't have access to be able to investigate and go ahead and come out with that. So it's just this interesting dichotomy that we have here where some folks you know, see it in their Bible, but science doesn't validate it for them. So there's no way of witnessing it in their reality other than the faith that they have in their religion that they existed. It's fascinating. Do you do you think that this will change and that science will just finally just go, you know what, there was amazing stuff going on here. We had giants, we had all sorts of cool stuff. With all the websites and podcasts and uh, video shows and uh, even ancient aliens, things like that, we are pushing those that are controlling things to the point where they will have to reveal things like our government has, you know, gone, uh, has exposed the fact that there are UFOs that they can't explain. All they're showing are these little TikTok images in a radar image, which is like showing you the big toe of a giant. And that's right. it. They, right. There's so much more, but they have been forced to do that. And uh, so the little guys like you and me are the grassroots that can help push this so that it'll have to be uh, acknowledged at some point. Ain't nothing little about either one of us, ma'am. You and I are giants in disguise. We just kind of tone it down a little bit as to be more relatable for folks. And that's how I see that's both it. Of us. That's, that's it. That's it. Uh, you know, and again, it's very interesting, this kind of, you know, psychological operation. I mean, it seems very contrived. It seems very deliberate. And it is to mislead you as so you don't really know what not only our history was, but this place is, you know, I find this very interesting that there's such a cover up uh, and they think we can't handle it and all that kind of stuff. But what's interesting and to your point about uh, us giants out here making these ripples in the pond is that we're it's it's uh, valuable, you know, as far as a commodity goes, like these shows are getting huge as far as people just talking about UFOs. These are million dollar shows. These are multi-million people listening and tuning okay. into these things. So there's a market for it now, which is really interesting. And, you know, your money speaks louder than anything else. Right. So I think exposing this stuff and then when they get good ad time on Discovery for running a Bigfoot show or something like that, if it's well done, then they see the benefits in putting this information out there for you. So like you, I agree. It's very valuable. Uh, because we're able to kind of make up our own mind and it encourages critical thinking, you know, these choice points in your reality. And each person in their own show feels like they're kind of alone, but there's a lot of oh. people who are doing these things. It, and that's great. That's great. In my mind, I'd see it the other way around because it's such a big part of my life. And I see it as, I, because the number of people I speak to in a regular, you know, per capita type of a basis is so small of that doesn't recognize UFOs is some sort of psychic, uh, you know, something crazy amazing, right? And so for me, in my reality, it looks like it's very populated with this, which is exciting for me. And it's kind of like this literal split, you know, that Dolores Cannon talks about, about this idea about how, yeah, they're over there playing their games or whatever, and we're over here doing the real work and, you know, talking about this amazing book, Spy in the Sky, and hanging out with Mary Joyce and stuff. So, it, it feels to me like it's a complete separation. But I know that there's a populace of people out there who haven't really entertained this stuff yet. But I like you think that it's become too mainstream now. It's become too popular, which is There exciting. used to be a time, if you talked about, let's say, UFOs, um, let's say uh, uh, there used to be a talk show with Larry King. And at that time, he was a big um, interviewer on, tele on mainstream television. But at that point, if you came on and talked about believing in UFOs, there always had to be the skeptic on the program at the same time. Yes. We no longer have that. So that's progress. That is an awesome point. You you bring up such an amazing point because not only that, you would see this on like Phil Donahue or something, right? These old school shows, you know, and uh, there'd be like one dude that's like, hey, UFOs are real. I kind of got scooped up by one. And then four panels, you know, or four deep of doctors and experts and psychologists telling him he's crazy and the audience just booing right. him. And so I agree with you. Now that voice is absent from the presentation of the information, which is huge. That's a it's massive huge. And we got to remember those kind of things yes. or let or people who don't remember those things. We need to tell them the, the perspective, Mary. Thank you so much. That was that was awesome. So uh, let's let's talk about some undersea pyramids because uh, that um, undersea crystal pyramid that they found in the uh, near uh, Bermuda Triangle years ago. The, the so structures, cool. the structures that I have found and presented in the book that are in the Pacific are totally different than the ones in the Atlantic. 
And I can give you a personal story on this one. Uh, when I lived on Cocoa Beach, I was with a friend and we were talking to a, a couple who were divers and we were at the pier in Cocoa Beach. And they were excited because they had been down to Vero Beach and had been diving and they had seen the peak of a pyramid in the sand. Now, in the uh, Atlantic, it's a there's a lot of sandy bottom. So when there is a major storm, that will get all turned up. And people who are um, treasure hunters, that's when they will go to the beach. That's when they will fly in little planes along the coast because that's when they're most likely to find old wrecks or whatever. Well, that's when these pyramids show up too. So I had heard this in this conversation at the bar at the pier. And I began to explore things on my own. And uh, in the book, I have a picture of uh, two pyramids that are just south of um, um, Paradise Island in the Bahamas. And one of those is a standard pyramid, and the other one is, is it looks like a step pyramid. No sooner did I post that on the website that somebody had gone in there with a little strip, almost like a Band-Aid, photographic satellite strip and put it right over where those were. So I have pictures of that uh, before and after again. So when I say secrets and cover-ups, there's cover-ups uh, quite a different, quite in many places. They're literally covering it up with just a light Literally colored, covering it up. Yeah, a band-aid strip of image. And they did that on Mars too. I have found like a city structure up there with the square walls and it's uh, spread over two of the photographic strips. Once I posted that, the clear delineation of those walls, on one half, they put a totally different strip in there. It looks like it's from the moon. Doesn't look like it's related to Mars at all. On the other side, it's just blurred. So I have the before and after pictures again. So when I talk about cover-ups, I've got a lot of evidence in that book to show that, yes, they really do cover things up. Damn. So, uh, you know, and I re I'm thinking of also like the moon spire and the spires on Phobos and Thobos, the moons of Mars and everything like that, the spire. And even uh, Aldrin screwed up and talked about the spire on Phobos once. And it, the, what they used to do with it was just kind of blur it out a little bit. What was funny about it, though, is you could still see the shadow coming off, you know, and people could still note different things and lights coming out of um, craters and stuff like that. You know, I've uh, got a, a – there's a gentleman in the business. Uh, his name is Crow777. I just recently had him on. He is a huge sky watcher. He has a telescope, and he does these amazing recordings. He films something called the lunar wave. Have you ever heard of this or seen that? No. It's basically a ripple that goes over the entire moon, where it, it's zoomed way in on the moon. I'm going to send it to you so that you can see it. But just uh, to explain it here, um, there's a ripple that goes over the moon, like it's a refresh or something like that. There's a lot of speculation about the moon. What do you think is going on on the moon? Um, I use Google Earth to explore the moon. I had very low expectations because we have had, we have been covering up stuff on the moon for decades, yeah. decades. Yeah. Surprisingly, I found one thing, and that was a white pyramid, which clearly looks like a white pyramid. It's 28 feet longer than a football field on each side. And um, it faces the earth. And I had the coordinates, so anybody can go find it. Why that has been left there, I do not know. Yeah, clearly foresighted there. That is absolutely fascinating. Again, guys, book but link. More in importantly, the show. Um, I include um, a transcript of an interview with Donna Hare. Yeah. And she uh, had some kind of high security clearance. She worked in the NASA photo lab. Um, she had she got different awards for many different things. And that's Donna Hare in that picture there. There you go. And um, a couple of things uh, stood out from that um, transcript. And it's interesting to read the whole thing. But one of the things that really stood out to me was she had another office in another location. And somebody from NASA uh, came into her office and he had a big gash on his head. And so she asked him about it. And I, uh, from the way it goes, it sounds like she knew him beforehand. And he had one of his jobs was to burn NASA photos of the moon so that people wouldn't see them. He took too long to look at one of these and the guard that was guarding him whacked him with the 
uh, rifle butt. And that was the reason he had a gash in his head. So um, there, she gave evidence that they are uh, destroying pictures. She also said in that interview that uh, uh, there are thousands of moon photos that NASA has uh, airbrushed, airbrushed the images. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, she was right there where it was happening. Donna Hare's story is fascinating. She was at the 2001 Press Club, um, National Press Club with uh, Greer as well. Absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, she died within th this year. I think the beginning of this year she died. Oh, did she? But did uh, this was this was back in 1995. So she was really, really uh, uh, breaking up news. And that was in Washington, D.C. before we had podcasts. And it was on one of the uh, major talk radio stations uh, in Washington, D.C. So Damn. I give her a lot of credit for uh, being so bold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you you found things uh, over off of uh, Canada. You found things off of Alaska, which is absolutely fascinating. Mark Ricksecker, we've had him on the show, and he talks about the Alaskan Triangle and all the interesting things coming up there. But I, I, I'm very fascinated what you said about the basically the building styles or the architecture. You know, <clears throat> when we compare things on like the 33rd parallel and things like that, you'll find similar megaliths, but they have their own style. You know, like the um, Teotihuacan, they built a pyramid complex, and it was obviously pyramids, but it was very Teotihuacan. You know, it was very their style. Same thing, uh, Palenque, um, then you've got the uh, stuff in Peru, and then we, we go over to Giza, and then allegedly Bosnian pyramids, and in China, and all this kind of stuff. And they're, they're definitely pyramid structures, but they're different and kind of tailored to the architecture, the style, the building materials available, all that kind of stuff. So whenever you talk about the uh, Mu in the Pacific and then what Atlantis in the Atlantic, correct? You know, that's basically where those were. It's fascinating to me that there are different building styles because this would right. fit in line. Different sizes and different styles. Totally, totally. So that is two clear, distinct civilizations, or we would have the same pattern uh, showing up like the pyramids show up in so much of the world. And what's even more interesting is the airport that you uh, found under the water here. I just want to come back to the 3,000 mile long one uh, or foot long one. Uh, it's 89 point. miles long. A regular airport is the longest one is three miles long to yes. give the comparison. Perfect. Absolutely. And thank you. It's interesting to me how uh, a runway would have been necessary. I mean, this has the by angles and everything. So again, I'm grateful that you included the the current airport below here and in Spokane. And uh, it it's interesting to me because when we talk about like Moo and Atlantis and stuff, I think UFOs. I don't think fixed wing flight that needs a lot of room to take off. You know what I mean? I'm thinking UFOs and stuff like that. So it's interesting that they had sort of or the need for a long stretch of runway like that. Um, also think about the uh, things that look like runways down in Peru, Nazca the Nazca lines. Plains. Yeah. Those are long too. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's what, I, that was my next question. So, you know, are we sure that this is an airport, but those long straight lines do kind of like the Nazca lines. Um, and Daniken did wonderful work. Von Daniken did wonderful work on this as well. Uh, they kind of draw you in and they're, they're, of course, those are, that's just a fascinating story guys. So definitely check into that, but you can only see those patterns from above, which is fascinating. Have you... Have you found anything like that under the ocean or on Mars or anything like that? Anything animal-like or bird-like or anything? No. Okay. Not under the ocean. Yeah. No. All on land. Mm -mm -mm. No, they everything looks like structures of some kind or another. Yeah. Or farmer's fields. There's one that looks like a major farmer's field. You can see all the markings, but who knows what it really was. Yeah. And uh, there was that wall that somebody found that's a kilometer high or something like that. And it goes from pole to pole all the way down into a wall that goes underneath the ocean. It's it, it's unmistakable. It's absolutely fascinating. I'll have to send you that too for your next book. What, are you making a list so I can get all this good stuff? You yes, got? absolutely. We share the info here. You know, this is your next. <laughs> oh yeah, you know. I know. That's, yeah. that's why I put the coordinates out there. I want people to see stuff. I love it. Okay, uh, let's talk about the sun real quick, because you have found some really cool things. Uh, now, I, the you sun. know, I can never promise that the stuff I found with Google Earth, that nobody else in the world has ever stumbled on these things. I can't promise you that, but I can. It's very likely you haven't seen these things. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the things, the giant UFOs around the sun, I know for a fact they haven't been published anywhere else. And in 2013, I was contacted by a man in the Netherlands, and he uh, sent me, I, I have them in the book, I have the original um, NASA photos, and then what he did was he cleaned up the debris. He zoomed in on these things, 
and then he he cleared it up so you could see the the um the detail of it now the one that um there's one there it looks like it has a wing structure uh we found two of those and one we called the isis hotel and the other one we called the um flying phoenix Phoenix. yeah because when you see more detail than what we're able to see on the screen here um they look like like condominiums now these are huge every single one in the book is bigger than jupiter and some of them are bigger than the sun there's one that looks like a an extension rod it goes way out like this it's longer than the width of the sun and the width of the sun uh that's just a portion of it the width of the sun is um uh over eight hundred thousand miles so compare th- there it is yeah compare that to the the sun and uh it's humongous absolutely humongous it's amazing and you know i've seen these uh videos of ufos that look like they're sucking energy from the sun have you seen that yeah there's one that uh it's like a round ball it has yeah. like an umbilical cord connected to the sun uh, it was up there for well over 70 hours, I think, Yeah, something maybe crazy. longer. And it really looks like it was uh, refueling. And we've seen this with uh, UFOs over water as well, is that they will kind yes. of suck water yes. spouts up like they're powered by water or something like that. You know, they may get memory from it as well, which is really deep and awesome. Perhaps that they know all the information on Earth by just sucking up the water because all the memory of everything is contained within water. That would be. By the way, I want to assure uh, your viewers that uh, um, they're seeing blurry pictures when you hold it up, but the pictures are pretty sharp and clear. Yeah, the way the camera's focus is set, it's a manual focus thing, so it's going to focus back here, but back here it doesn't look right. So, uh, yes, all the uh, images in there will be blurry a little bit, but I'll tell you what, I'll run No, that's through. okay. That gives people a hint of it. I just want them to know that the pictures in the book aren't blurry like that. No, they're not. No, they're wonderful, and it's an awesome job you did on this, and I know that these aren't inexpensive to make, and you still spent the extra cash and did it for us at, at the... Um, behest of the experience of the reader here and so thank you for doing that honestly you've given us something really really nice to enjoy and it's just one of those books you get so excited about whenever it came in i was just skipping you know my wife brought it brought it it's up also the, the kind mailbox. of thing you can leave on the table and you don't have to say a word people will usually pick it up and you can get them thinking and you can get conversations going that you might not otherwise get into. It's a great point. It's been back here and I've just been thumbing through it uh, for the past week or so. So um, absolutely outstanding. Well, um, I am very curious about what you think about deep underground military bases before we let you run here. So tell us a little bit about that. What do you think is going on? Okay. I've actually done a book on that. It's called um, Underground Military Bases Hidden in North Carolina Mountains. Um, and I write uh, about five of them here in the, in Western North Carolina. And uh, it's interesting. They tend to be under uh, public lands. There's we, the most recent one. The most recent one that's been built is beneath the Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, there's one that's near Chimney Rock, which is a, a state park here. There's one um, in near where all the Brown Mountain lights are seen in North Carolina. But anyhow... Um, that started because there was a couple that kept coming into where I was working at the time. They knew about the website. They would shyly and gingerly uh, bring up the subject of UFOs and start to talk to me. And uh, they came in repeatedly. And finally, I said, you know, they had seen some stuff. And I, I said, well, let me interview you. And so they finally agreed to it. And we met at their camper trailer. And that wasn't the reason they wanted to meet with me. The woman had grown up on a high security military base where everybody, including the family members of the employees, uh, were sworn to secrecy and got in deep doo-doo if they talked. And she wanted to tell me about a facility here in North Carolina uh, that's beneath the Pisca Astronomical Research uh, Institute. That's what it's called now. But it used to be with the Department of Defense. And she's the one that told me it was uh, six stories d- uh, deep, uh, city size, uh, self-sufficient, and she gave me a whole lot of other information. And she said they're doing things with mind control there. Well, needless to say, I started with her story, and uh, I just kept digging, and I kept finding people who uh, were willing to tell me things. And uh, so that's how that book got started. Damn. And yes, but I had to be checked out. She had they. She and her husband had to know that they could trust me uh, before I ever got a story out of that. 
Yeah, and you, you've got a phenomenal list of books here. Bigfoot, Beyond the Footprints, uh, Tangible Evidence of Jesus Christ Left Behind for Us to Find, Cherokee, The Little People Were Real, uh, Underground Military Bases, and Spy in the Sky. It's fascinating. Uh, you've, of course, been on Coast to Coast, which uh, has a special place in my heart. And uh, that's unbelievable. Uh, well, Mary Joyce, we will have you back any damn time that you want. You have an open invitation. This has been phenomenal. Spy in the Sky and all of the ways to find her, guys, will be located down in the show notes. Make sure that you check her out. Mary Joyce, thank you so much. This is incredible. Thank you. It was a joy talking to you. All the hugs in the world right there going out to Mary A. Joyce for coming by and hanging out with this. Her website linked below. Make sure you guys check that out as well. She has a wonderful wealth of uh, different topics that she covers over there, kind of like us over here on the show, but just a really cool wealth of information, guys. It's, it's amazing and wide and variety, and, but all super badass. Now, her book, Spy in the Sky, that we talked about on the show here today, Secrets and Cover-Ups on Earth and Beyond, will be located down there right alongside her website, so make sure you all check that out. While you guys are down in the show notes, check out our affiliate links. We've got Food Forest Abundance, Get Your Freedom from Fear on, Opus, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support. If you want to start your own podcast, there is a link down there that reads, Start Your Own Podcast, made it as obvious as I could for you. We partnered with Red Circle, and that's going to get you started in the right direction. Now, also, if you really want to step your game up while you're starting your own podcast, you just want to go ahead and do it. Uh, the Manifestors guy, Dewey Taylor, a good friend of mine, uh, started a sponsorship offer just for you, the listeners of this show, at checkout, type Expanding Reality, all caps, no spaces. That's how you get it done. Awesome, awesome stuff. Now, also, while you guys are down there, expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is our central hub. That's our baby. That's where we're at. That's where everything's going. So, Check that out for sure, guys. Uh, everything is played over there completely free. Now, if you want to support the show and hop into the bonus side of stuff, that's also where you can do that. And it's called Becoming an Expansive Insider. And you sign up for that thing. You get on there. One of the best ways to support the show, guys. But if you want to support the show and you don't want to do all that and take advantage of that cool stuff, then no worries at all. Support the mission. That's how you get it done right there. All right, everybody, so go out into this incredibly cool place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all pick up a piece of litter, be nice to everybody you come across, get out of the left-hand lane, because you know that's a pain in the ass, and above all, and anything else, go out into this incredibly beautiful and mysterious place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all just be good to one another. That's it. Just be good to one another. Thank you so much for watching, for listening, for engaging, and just being the coolest sons of bitches ever. We'll see you next time.